Now we will enter part three of our course, which concerns the federal trust relationship between federal agencies and the Indian tribes within the United States. This federal trust relationship imposes an obligation on virtually every federal agency in the United States government. And to refresh your memory, the trust responsibility has been at the core of federal Indian relations since the beginning of federal Indian law when Justice Marshall announced it in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. It is really at its core a property concept. The ceded lands conveyed by the Indian tribes formed consideration for a promise, and that was that the federal government would continue to protect the Native nations retained land and resources and their harvest rights off the reservation and on the reservation into perpetuity. Well, this promise has formed what we call a trust construct. The United States is in a position, a formal position, of acting as trustee towards Indian tribes. One court has expressed it this way. The ownership of Indian trust lands, analogous to one existing under a common law trust, with the United States as trustee, the Indian tribes or individuals as beneficiaries, and the property and natural resources managed by the United States as the trust corpus, Department of the Interior versus Klamath Water Users Protective Association. Those were words expressed by the Supreme Court of the United States not very long ago in 2001. They form the framework of a continuing obligation that is enforceable in courts of the United States. There are two aspects to this obligation in effect. One is the management of Indian lands and resources themselves, and the other is the um, obligation of federal agencies acting outside of Indian territory. We'll get to both of those in a moment. But first, let us pause and recognize that all of these Indian law principles are in effect outside of and independent of the statutory law or regulations that you may deal with. You can almost think of the law as having several rooms and most federal agents or officials uh, come to work and, and they pretty much see one room of the law through their statutes and regulations which they usually know quite well. But another room of the law is equally applicable and is simply independent of uh, the statutes and regulations and that would be the principles of federal Indian law. So when we think of the trust obligation, we have to recognize that it operates along with the regulations and statutes. Courts have said time and time again that this trust obligation imposes the highest standard of fiduciary care or the most exacting behavior on the federal government. Well, as I said, there are two aspects to the trust relationship, so let's go into those now. The first is the federal management of Indian lands and resources. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, located within the U.S. Department of of Interior is the designated agent for the United States to carry out the trust relationship. Recall that the federal government technically owns the natural resources and lands of the tribes in trust for the tribes. Now that means that the federal government can't profit itself from that ownership but rather must manage in the best interests of the tribes and Indian beneficiaries. BIA is the agency charged with the task of carrying out this management. More and more tribes are taking over their own programs. For example, we talked about tribes developing their own environmental programs under environmental statutes. In this era of self-determination and sovereignty, tribes are very anxious to take over their own programs on the, the reservations. In particular, uh, when um, many times the BIA has in the past mismanaged Indian land and resources uh, to the great detriment of tribes. For example, with respect to the Quinault Indian lands up in northwest Washington, the BIA clear-cut such lands so badly that it caused enormous destruction of fisheries. And so the Quinault Indian nation um, is anxious to um, 
manage its own lands, and that would be typical of many tribes. But still, the federal government is positioned as trustee, which means that the BIA needs to, or is in the position of, approving any lease or any sale of Indian property or major resource. That is to say, tribes, because of their unique title that was characterized by Justice Marshall way back in Johnson v. McIntosh, tribes can't just sell or alienate their lands and resources without federal approval. And this comes as a surprise to many. Moreover, in exercising the federal management role, several modern statutes do apply to the BIA. For example, the National Environmental Policy Act, which requires environmental study before any federal agency takes major action affecting the environment, well, that statute applies to BIA in carrying out management on federal Indian lands. The Endangered Species Act also applies to tribal lands and BIA activities on those lands. So there is an entire realm of BIA responsibility with respect to Indian lands. This, I mentioned there were two aspects of the trust relationship. We've covered one which is on the reservation, but the other one is off the reservation. There are so many actions now that federal agencies take that do affect Indian tribes. Many of these actions are through environmental statutes that permit enormous destruction of resources that tribes still rely on. Let's take a look at just a few. Uh, in the Coeur d'Alene watershed of Washington and Idaho, the federal government has uh, undertaken enormous logging and approved mining. These have consequences for the entire watershed, and as a result, the Spokane tribe and other tribes of the region have a great challenge uh, facing them because their fisheries are contaminated with uh, enormous mining pollution. In the Mount Hood area and forests across the country, the U.S. Forest Service engages in activities that threaten sacred sites of many tribes. And again, these sites are on federal lands. They used to be aboriginal lands owned by the tribes themselves that were then conveyed probably through treaty. At the Hanford site in Washington State, the U.S. Department of Defense operates one of the most contaminated sites in the entire world at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. The radioactive waste from this site uh, is leaching into the Columbia River, and that poses enormous contamination and potentially devastating effects for the fisheries and the people who eat them. These are the same fisheries that we saw were protected by treaty fisheries used by the Nez Perce, Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs tribes, and Shoshone Bannocks. And finally, another example we've already talked about is the federal operation of the hydropower system on the Columbia River. This hydropower system kills over 90 percent of the migrating juveniles of some species of fish, and it is a factor in the pen, in the uh, threatened extinction of many fisheries in the Columbia River Basin. So we must ask, how is the trust obligation to protect these resources enforced? Tribes have two avenues available to them to enforce the trust obligation. The first one is through the Tucker Act. The Tucker Act is an act that provides damages, that means monetary relief, to the tribes. It is often used by tribes against the Bureau of Indian Affairs when that agency has purportedly mismanaged the tribal resource. For example, we saw uh, the Quinault Nation and a slide of the, the timber resources up there. The Quinault Indian Nation brought a huge Tucker Act claim against the BIA for mismanaging its timber resources. The second avenue is through the Administrative Procedure Act and this act allows tribes to seek injunctive relief. That means um, a court would stop some action, prevent it from going forward, or force some remedy. And so when we think of uh, 
uh, protecting fisheries in the Columbia River Basin or stopping a logging, a timber sale or, or something of that sort. Um, tribes would often go through this avenue to prevent detrimental action from occurring. So we have two levels or two avenues to enforce the trust obligation. And courts have taken this trust obligation seriously and many times have enforced it to the maximum extent. The Forest Service has a substantive duty to protect, to the fullest extent possible, the tribe's treaty rights and the resources on which those rights depend. Klamath Tribes versus United States Forest Service. In carrying out its fiduciary duty, it is the federal agency's responsibility to ensure that Indian treaty rights are given full effect. Northwest Sea Farms versus United States Army Corps of Engineers. The United States, as trustee for the tribes, has a responsibility to protect their rights and resources. Klamath Water Users Protective Association versus Patterson. The real challenge for tribes today is to gain some sort of co-management role for resources off the reservation. As we have seen, those resources carry enormous importance to tribes. Tribes were once very successful trustees of those resources and managed them successfully even to the extent of ensuring uh, abundant harvest of fish for 10,000 years in the Columbia River Basin. And so many tribes today are trying to figure out ways to regain their environmental sovereign prerogatives across lands that they have lost over time under the U.S. framework of law. This is a real challenge for tribes because recall the tribe's jurisdiction as nations is limited to the land within their boundaries. It's limited to the reservations. But as we have noted repeatedly, many of the actions taken outside the reservations have enormous consequences for tribes. Here you see in this slide uh, a culvert. And um, as I mentioned, the culverts create passage problems for fisheries that the tribes rely on. So fisheries um, go down uh, the more culverts there are that, that do not operate functionally. How do tribes address this? How do they seek ways of finding a co-management handle? There are basically three potential avenues. One is through litigation. And we mentioned earlier a case from the um, District Court of Washington that uh, involved culverts and said that the treaties of the Pacific Northwest have an environmental protection element to them. That would be one avenue whereby tribes of the Pacific Northwest could determine what goes on off the reservation with respect to these culverts. In general, litigation involving tribal treaty rights in the Pacific Northwest has been very successful for tribes. In both Washington and Oregon, tribes have managed to gain a tremendous role in fisheries harvest management through litigation. The second potential avenue is through treatment as state programs under federal environmental law. These are the TAS programs that we mentioned earlier in this course. Under federal environmental law, tribes can establish their own environmental prog programs that apply to their own reservations, but a rather sleeper provision of many laws would allow those program standards to be enforced even off the reservation. There are a couple of major cases actually uh, upholding the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for enforcing strict tribal water quality standards off the reservation in areas under state jurisdiction. So this represents a novel and increasingly firm avenue for tribes to extend their own prerogatives outside the reservations to protect their lands and resources. The third category is, involves cooperative agreements, contracts, and programs under the Tribal Self-Governance Act. There are many mechanisms that allow tribes to simply bargain with the federal government to undertake management off the reservation 
in their aboriginal areas. The federal government often pays for the tribes to undertake management off the reservation. A wonderful case study of this involves the, the gray wolf, honored by the Nez Perce tribe as, as part of its culture. Gray wolf, salmon, deer, eagle, whatever the species may be, they have a place and a purpose. When humans remove or destroy that link, that connection, we lose. And everyone lo loses, of course, in the world and in this region. But the Les Nez Perce lose a bit more of their culture, of their spirituality, and most certainly of their treaty rights. Levy Holt. Holt is a leader of the Nez Perce tribe, and when the wolf was listed, it came under uh, the jurisdiction of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to recover these wolves in Idaho and areas of other states, but it needed a partner in Idaho to actually carry out the recovery objectives. Well, the state of Idaho was not interested. The state of Idaho was opposed to the recovery of wolves. And so the Nez Perce tribe, which we have looked at in several contexts, stepped forward and said, we will contract with you to carry out the recovery of wolves in Idaho because it's a cultural species for us. So that agreement was made between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Nez Perce tribe. The tribe hired two full-time biologists and other seasonal staff to monitor radio collared wolves. They kept track of pack behavior and reproduction. They relocated wolves that attacked cattle or sheep. They negotiated with ranchers and built up friendly relations with the ranching community, which was traditionally opposed to wolf reintroduction. The tribe's program was an off the chart success. By 2000, there were about 191 wolves with 18 packs producing 16 litters of pups on average each. The problem then became it was such a success that the federal government then moved to delist the wolf and remove its protection under the Endangered Species Act. The wolf had been successfully recovered by the tribe. When that delisting occurred, the state of Idaho then was positioned to take over management of the wolf and the tribe would not have a major role. The state determined that the wolves would be open to hunting seasons, and that determination was just enjoined recently, last month, uh, by Judge Malloy, a federal district court judge in Montana. So we see from this story a successful role of the tribes in recovering a species, but we also see the conflict between different management prerogatives on behalf of the state and the tribe. Well, another avenue that has great potential for tribal um, management is found under the Tribal Self-Governance Act. If you recall the slide where we talked about various modern statutes geared towards self-determination, I said there was a sleeper provision in one of them. Well, that one is the Tribal Self-Governance Act. The Tribal Self-Governance Act was passed to allow tribes to uh, take over programs on their own reservations. But one provision in it, Section 458 CC, actually allows tribes to receive annual funding agreements to administer programs and services under the jurisdiction of the Department of Interior outside the reservation. The idea is the tribes can get money under this act from Department of Interior to manage or participate in the management of areas off their reservation that were of Aboriginal importance to them. Now remember this act because we have an exercise at the end of this session where you'll be asked to apply it to specific hypotheticals. Well, this act allows tribes to uh, to gain funding agreements subject to the approval of BIA in areas which are, and I'll quote from the Act now, of specific geographic, historical, or cultural significance to them. The Department of Interior has actually issued a regulation listing what federal areas could be subject to these agreements 
and could open up opportunities for tribal management. Again, they have to be areas where the tribe has an aboriginal nexus, as it's called, some relationship to that particular area. In 2003, the Secretary of Interior identified 34 national parks, including this beautiful Glacier National Park in Montana, and 15 national wildlife refuges that could be eligible for tribal funding agreements. This is at the cutting edge of Indian law because it represents an avenue whereby tribes could gain a management prerogative in areas that are important to them, but at the same time areas they no longer have jurisdiction over because they've lost property ownership of them. One of the leading examples of activity under this act involves the Salish Kootenai tribe. In 2004, the Department of Interior negotiated an agreement with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Indian Tribes of Montana to undertake biological fire maintenance and visitor program management activities in the 18,500-acre National Bison Range Complex, which is operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Again, the Tribal Self-Governance Act only applies to areas managed within the U.S. Department of Interior. So because U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is within the U.S. Department of Interior, it was eligible to enter into an agreement with the Salish Kootenai tribes. The experience in negotiating this agreement was difficult because oftentimes the federal agencies and the tribes have different bargaining points and different positions. The tribe, no doubt, would usually want more of an environmental prerogative or management prerogative. The federal government may want less, and this is a constant tension in trying to figure out avenues for tribes to regain their environmental prerogatives off the reservation. It's a tension that I think we'll deal with in the exercise coming up. Related to this bison management is another initiative involving 51 tribes, including, again, the Nez Perce tribe that we've looked at throughout this course as a case study. 51 tribes are now members of the Intertribal Bison Cooperative, which is an organization with a mission to restore bison to Indian nations in a manner that is compatible with their spiritual and cultural beliefs and practices. This organization has a collective herd of over 8,000 bison located across various tribal lands, and it's working to reestablish more herds to promote cultural enhancement, ecological restoration, and economic development. The ITBC, the Intertribal Bison Cooperative, coordinates education and training programs, develops marketing strategies and distribution plans for buffalo meat, and provides technical assistance to tribes in managing the herds. In 2003, the ITBC undertook an initiative to gain a role in managing the Yellowstone National Park bison herd. When the Yellowstone bison population exceeds a threshold of about 2,400 animals, the herd typically migrates outside the park boundaries. And when it does so, it brings the threat of brucellosis, which is a disease carried by bison, to private livestock ranches in Montana. So ranchers are very opposed to bison migrating off Yellowstone because they perceive a threat to their own herds through this disease. The National Park Service in the state of Montana had negotiated a plan a few years ago that allows the Park Service to capture and kill these bison. In 2003, over 2,000 bison were killed under the plan. The goal of the Intertribal Bison Cooperative is to turn the management away from killing bison and to lay the groundwork for getting these buffalo a clean bill of health and relocated to tribal lands as an alternative to the killing. We see in this story um, successful tribal initiatives involving a cooperative of many tribes and in all cases they are linked by the cultural foundation we spoke of a while ago. This cultural foundation, this spiritual relationship to the animals really forms the impetus and the parameters for management um, on, on behalf of these tribes. The American buffalo, also known as bison, has always held great meaning for American Indian people. To Indian people, buffalo represent their spirit 
and remind them of how their lives were once lived, free and in harmony with nature. In the 1800s, the white man recognized the reliance Indian tribes had on the buffalo. Thus began the systematic destruction of the buffalo to try to subjugate the western tribal nations. The slaughter of over 60 million buffalo left only a few hundred buffalo remaining. Without the buffalo, the independent life of the Indian people could no longer be maintained. The Indian spirit, along with that of the buffalo, suffered an enormous loss. At that time, tribes began to sign treaties with the United States government in an attempt to protect the land and the buffalo for their future generations. The destruction of buffalo herds and the associated devastation to the tribes disrupted the self-sufficient lifestyle of Indian people more than all other federal policies to date. Those words are from the website for the Intertribal Bison Cooperative. And on that website, you can find many resources that talk more about these strategies to develop buffalo herds once again. Well, now we are going to turn to an exercise that we hope brings together some of these co-management goals and strategies. We're going to ask you to divide into small groups of two to four people. And in those groups, we would like you to fill in the chart we have presented on the screen. We've presented three different factual hypotheticals, and I'll go through these in a moment. Those are reflected in the boxes on the left. We would like you, for each hypothetical, to assume that you're working for the tribe, not a federal agency, but rather for the tribe involved. And we'd like to ask you, in each hypothetical, what kind of involvement does the tribe want? Does the tribe want to set standards that is really um, have a say in what the environment actually looks like off the reservation? Or number two, and I'm referring to this box on the top here, number two, does the, scribe, does the tribe want to have discretionary implementation of standards set by the federal government? In other words, number two represents the instance where the federal government sets the ecological condition and the tribe determines how to achieve that condition. Number three is non-discretionary implementation. This is where a tribe really just carries out the plan in all of its technical deal, detail and doesn't have much of any management say over the area. And number four, enforcement, is a role where the tribe simply just enforces the rules that apply. Perhaps tribal uh, wardens are deputized by state or federal authorities to carry out this enforcement. So those represent one, two, three, and four different avenues or let us say different levels of engagement in management off the reservation. We'd also like you to consider on behalf of the tribe a possible strategy and what kind of authority there might be for tribal involvement. And then finally moving over to the right hand column consider some likely opposition because most times um, that management changes hands as you all well know uh, there's usually opposition, no matter whether the instance involves tribes or not. Well, now, let me um, reflect or, or introduce these three hypotheticals we've got. The first one involves sage grouse reintroduction on Bureau of Land Management lands. Here, the tribe you work for wants to initiate a reintroduction program for the sage grouse both on tribal lands and lands that it ceded once that are now held in BLM ownership. BLM is a federal agency within the Department of Interior. Make sure you make note of that. This species, the sage grouse, has been proposed for Endangered Species Act listing, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has, decided, has not yet decided to list it. It's pending. Reintroduction would require significant habitat restoration and protection and may negatively impact grazing practices off the reservation. Ranchers with grazing leases on public lands oppose this idea of tribal co-management. So that is your first hypothetical and with that we're going to ask you what is the tribe trying to achieve? Is it trying to set standards or 
um, engaged in discretionary implementation or non-discretionary implementation or enforcement? And what kind of strategies can you come up with? I think the opposition has already been mentioned in that one. Number two hypothetical involves the Devil's Tower Monument. Here, the tribe you work for wants to develop an educational program for the Devil's Tower National Mo Monument, which is currently managed by the National Park Service. That is an agency, again, within the Department of Interior. So it is one of those agencies subject to the Self-Governance Act we just talked about when the glacier slide was in front of you. The program that the tribe wants would educate visitors on native religious and cultural interests in the monument, the history of federal tribal relations, and the ecosystem values associated with the monument. And the third hypothetical involves huckleberry management on U.S. Forest Service lands. Here, the tribe you work for wants to co-manage huckleberry resources on a national forest located adjacent to the reservation but within its aboriginal ceded territory. The U.S. Forest Service manages this forest. Note that the U.S. Forest Service is actually in the Department of Agriculture, so it is not an agency subject to that Self-Governance Act that I highlighted moments ago. Gathering rights for huckleberries are not expressly mentioned in this tribe's treaty with the federal government, but they have been exercised since time immemorial and the berries continue to form a central part of the cultural and subsistence needs of the tribe. So to give you a hint, a court might find they have treaty protection. Because logging practices, fire suppression policy, and pesticide use all impact the huckleberry resource, your tribe seeks a decision role in the management decisions of the Forest Service. Your tribe also wants to regulate the amount of huckleberries taken by non-Indian recreational and commercial gatherers on the National Forest. So with this, we will pause for a break and give you time to work together in groups. Again, your goal is to fill in each of the blank boxes with some notes, telling us what type of involvement does your tribe want in this scenario, what is a possible strategy or authority for involvement, reflecting back to the slide that we gave you showing three possible avenues, litigation, contracting, and TAS programs, and consider some likely opposition. We'll return in a moment. Well, you've had time to discuss this exercise. We're keeping the chart on the board so that we can fill it in. And uh, John, Michael, and I will take a shot at discussing this ourselves just to give you an idea what our thoughts are on this exercise. So, John, Michael, let's turn to the first one, the sage grouse reintroduction on BLM lands. Let's, uh, let's let you take a shot at filling in the first box. What do, what do you think that is? Setting standards or discretionary implementation, non-discretionary implementation, or enforcement? I think that this first one is probably uh, probably has to do with setting standards or conditions dealing with uh, introducing the sage grouse, such as controlling the number of sage grouse. I think you're right. Um, setting standards is probably the most ambitious for a tribe, but it wants to set numbers, and that seems to be setting the ecological condition. And I guess uh, my job now is filling in the second box, which is what kind of strategy would the tribe pursue? Well, I suppose if sage grouse were a treaty resource, um, it could consider litigation avenues under treaty law. That seems a little unlikely um, for sage grouse. So let me turn to the more likely one, which is um, pursuing an agreement under the Self-Governance Act. That was for the audience, the act I mentioned um, that allows tribes to get funding from the Department of Interior to implement programs on federal lands. Now, the easy part of this for the tribe is that BLM is an agency within the Department of Interior, so definitely um, it is a qualifying agency. I think the hard part of this, though, is that in negotiating agreements with the federal government, there is going to be a tension. 
the federal agency must maintain control over the federal functions. And it will likely say that it is a federal function, not a tribal function, to set the levels of recovery. Um, the tribe can have a lot of input into that, but when the two conflict, I think that's going to be a difficult barrier for our tribe to overcome. So what's your thought on opposition? I think that for opposition, you're probably going to get um, some ranchers who aren't happy with tribal management of sage grouse and um, others who might argue that uh, tribal control would invade the inherently federal function of managing BLM lands. Yep, I think that sums it up for the sage grouse. No doubt all of you have additional thoughts, but let's move on to Devil's Tower Monument. So we've got the tribe wanting to establish an educational program on this um, federal site. John Michael, what kind of involvement do you think this presents? Um, I think that for this one, you're probably dealing with number two, discretionary implementation, um, especially if they can determine the content of the educational program. Uh, it's not so much that they're setting standards as they're simply implementing the educational program. Yeah, it's not setting standards, but they're determining the content. So that's different from, say, non-discretionary implementation where they would just simply, you know, punch the video or load the video. or <laughs> They're determining the content of the video. I think you're right. The possible strategy for this involvement, I'll tackle that second box. Um, again, we've got an agency, de the Park Service, which is within the Department of Interior. So we have another qualifying agency under the um, Self-Governance Act. And I think this holds um, more realistic possibilities for the tribe in that the, the, the culture of the tribe is relevant to Park Service management and the tribe is the best position, not the federal agency, to determine the content of that educational programming. Um, do you foresee any likely opposition with that? Uh, not really. I think that um, this is a program that would be uh, likely to succeed. Yeah, and increasingly uh, parks do have this kind of uh, programming that does involve quite a bit of the history, um, pre-colonial history. Moving to number three, the huckleberry management on U.S. Forest Service land that your tribe wants to engage in. Um, they want to do quite a few things here. So what, what type of involvement do you foresee here? Um, again, I think this is uh, more similar to number one than number two. I think that they would uh, be setting standards, again, controlling the huckleberry resources. Uh, seems like the highest form of co-management. Well, I think you're right, especially since um, the tribe is motivated to do this because of the pesticide use, the possible overharvest, um, and some of the logging activities which threaten the huckleberry resource. So this, this is actually where the tribe's saying, federal agency, uh, you're not setting the right standards and we have a different vision of this management. So the possible strategy for involvement is a little trickier here. I'm in the second box. Um, it's trickier because the Forest Service is not an agency within the Department of Interior. Therefore, the Self-Governance Act does not apply. Now, that doesn't eliminate all chances of a cooperative funding agreement by any means. Any federal agency can enter into an agreement with tribes to um, carry out aspects of management. So certainly, just like the Nez Perce, uh, entered into an agreement with Fish and Wildlife Service. That was actually not a self-governing agreement. That was just a regular uh, contract. Certainly the federal agency here, the Forest Service, can enter into an agreement with this tribe for management. Um, again, probably the federal agency has its own vision of how this land should be managed that differs from the tribal vision. I would say here treaty litigation is a possibility. Even though the Huckleberry rights are not explicitly mentioned in the treaties, Huckleberry gar uh, harvest and general harvest, since this continued since time immemorial, would likely be interpreted by a court to be protected by the treaty, even though it's not explicitly mentioned in the treaty. In other words, courts interpret the treaties as the Indians themselves would have understood them. That's the actual language from several court cases, as a matter of fact. So a court would likely say these tr tribal people had relied on huckleberries when they entered into the treaty and they should still ensure their continued existence under the treaty. 
because of the recent culverts decision, which we talked about, is called U.S. v. Washington Phase Two culverts decision, uh, where a court actually found a right of environmental protection in the treaty um, with respect to harvest of fish, I think there's a possibility that that decision could expand into some other scenarios, including other harvest scenarios under treaties. So litigation would be a strategy that a tribe may wish to pursue. Uh, what kind of opposition might they encounter? Well, I think that tribes trying to assert um, treaty rights might butt heads with uh, commercial huckleberry growers and loggers um, in particular. Yes, this, uh, this is probably the most difficult scenario for a tribe to tackle, but one which carries on and may be important to carry on its traditional harvest prerogatives. Well, with that, we have come to the end of our course on federal Indian law and policy. It's been a great privilege to do this course and present this area of law, and we thank you for your attention. Thank you. We would like to end this session with a quote from Renard Strickland, who is considered a foremost authority on federal Indian law. And we put in this quote with the hopes that it will provide some thoughtful um, lead in to the future ahead. Thank you. History suggests that if mankind is to survive, the next 500 years must be rooted in the pre-Columbian ethic of the Native American. The second American quincentenary belongs to the Indian. The continuation of the past, the conqueror's exploitation of the earth, can mean only one thing. No one, Indian or non-Indian, will survive. Renard Strickland